Today on the John Akerberg Show, we will examine the topic, Christ among other gods. Maybe you've heard it said that all religions are equal, but do you really think that's true? If you think that all the deities are the same, or that all religions agree on the essential points, then this program is for you. Religion, if it is worth the name, claims to make factual statements about spiritual reality. This means that every religion has the responsibility of giving evidence for its truth claims. Such evidence should be accessible to believers and non-believers alike. Christ presented himself as the one and only qualified Savior who was able to bring men and women to God. Today, we will examine the evidence he gave for his claim and also talk about Christ's ascension into heaven and promise to return to the earth in the future. My guest today is Dr. Erwin Lutzer, pastor emeritus of the Moody Church in Chicago, Illinois, where he served as the senior pastor for 36 years. He is featured on radio programs across the country, speaks internationally, and is the award-winning author of numerous books. We invite you to join us for this important edition of The John Akerberg Show. Welcome to our program, I'm John Ankerberg, and today we're talking about a very interesting topic that I think you will be interested in. What are we talking about when we talk about the ascension and return of Jesus Christ? What difference does that phrase even mean to you? Luke, the writer of the book of Acts and the book of Luke, wrote in Acts chapter 1 about this ascension of Christ, and I want you to listen to what he's saying and we want to apply this eventually to you, okay? But see if you can gather what he's saying. He's talking about Jesus, and after Jesus had said these things, he was lifted up while they were watching, the disciples were watching, and a cloud took Jesus up out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, then behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them, and they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Erwin, what does this show? What is the ascension? And why is it important to all of us that are listening today? First of all, I want to say to the many who have joined us that one day I was in a cab and the man who was driving the car was a very religious man and he had his religious book on the dash of the car. And I knew that the founder of his religion had been dead for many centuries. I said to him, what is the founder of your religion doing now? And he looked back at me and said, what do you mean nobody knows what he's doing now? I want you to know today, my friend, that we have a good glimpse of what Jesus Christ is actually doing now. Because the ascension of Jesus means that he did ascend into heaven, and the Bible tells us some of the things that he is involved in. And that also involves you and your struggles. John, in answer to your question, what we must recognize is that when Jesus was raised from the dead, he had his heavenly eternal body. Now, nobody at this point has that. You know, there are people in heaven and the soul takes on the characteristics of the body so that people are able to talk and recognize one another. But the resurrection for all of us is yet future. But Jesus had his eternal body. Now, can we imagine he's going into heaven, and heaven is both a state as well as a place, and he's on his way, and suddenly the angels begin to recognize him, of course, because they've been watching him on earth, the Bible says. And this is the first time that a human being has been in heaven with a permanent eternal body. Now, we can almost imagine, because the angels know who Jesus is, 
We can almost imagine as they are shouting, holy, 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 they are bowing down before him because he is king and he is Lord. Now here's the remarkable thing about Jesus in the heavenlies. He is there and he has his body there, as all of us know, but because he is God, he's also with us by his spirit. That's why before he left, he could say to the disciples, all power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. And then he says, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Yeah, the Bible puts it this way, Jesus ascended far above all rule and authority. And it shows the awesome position of Christ and the power that he holds. I mean, I want people to be able to imagine that because it really shows the sovereignty of Jesus Christ. Now, he's not exercising all of that sovereignty right at this moment. He is waiting until he's going to return again. And we're actually going to be talking about the return in just a few moments. But you know, John, the Bible says that right now, Jesus Christ is interceding for those who know him. What does that intercession mean? It means that Jesus Christ represents us to God the Father, so that those who have believed upon Jesus are welcomed by the Father and treated with the same kind of dignity and love as the Son himself has, Jesus Christ, because he actually takes our place. Now, I want everyone who is suffering, and there's plenty of suffering in the world, particularly those who are going through times of persecution, I want them to listen carefully. Ten times in the New Testament, it says that Jesus Christ, when he ascended into heaven, sat down on the right hand of God the Father. By the way, why was he able to sit down? It's because his work was done. You know, the priests in the Old Testament, they weren't allowed to sit down as long as they were on duty. You know, they had various shifts and so forth because to sit down meant that you were finished. And God was saying, as far as the sacrifices are concerned, you're never finished. All right. But Jesus sat down. He had completed the work that God gave him to do. But John, you may know this already. There is one time in all the New Testament where Jesus Christ who was seated at the right hand of God the Father when he actually stood up. And you know the story. Stephen is being stoned. Stephen is the first martyr of the Christian church, and his story is in Acts chapter 7. And uh, you can imagine the suffering of being stoned. You can also imagine the fact that Stephen knows that he's going to die shortly and God does something for Stephen that he doesn't do for us because he wanted Stephen to represent, however, what is really happening in the spirit world. It says that Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. It's almost as if Jesus is saying, Stephen, I know that the stones hurt. Soon you're going to be with me. But I want you to know that when you die, I'm here for you. And for all those who have trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, the good news is this. When we die, Jesus will be there for us to welcome us into the heavenly kingdom. Yeah, Jesus actually prayed while he was on earth to the Father. He said, Glorify me on earth with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. And John, that's not all. In the book of John, chapter 17, he says, Glorify them with the glory that thou hast given me. What God has in mind for us is absolutely mind boggling. Yeah, it answers the question. What is Jesus doing now that he is in heaven and he has all power? What's he doing? Well, what he's doing, first of all, as I mentioned, he's standing in for us. He's representing us to the Father. 
and by His Holy Spirit, He's encouraging us. But at some point, He is going to return, and that's the other topic that we need to talk about today. Oh, yeah. He's going to return bodily back to the Mount of Olives where He ascended. And that's the remarkable story. So when we talk about Jesus, we're speaking about someone who is not dead, dead, but actually today is active in heaven. And we need to understand that. And that shows his authority. It shows his power. And by the way, there was a reformer who was actually put to death for his faith who said this, he who believes that Christ reigns above need not fear what happens below. In other words, when we belong to Christ, with all of the suffering that is around us, we need not fear because we have a man in the heavens who represents us, and when we die, we go to be with him, and eventually we're going to have a body like unto his body, the Bible says. For the Christian, the future is incredibly exciting. Because Jesus also, you have said and written in the book, He is interceding for Christians right now. Exactly. In fact, John says, you know, that if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. I wish, John, that all who are listening to this today would understand the extent to which Jesus loves us, cares about us, we are the most important thing on the universe that attracts his attention because he died to redeem us, as we discussed in the last program, gave his life for us, and he wants us to be with him forever. Right. The Bible says that he wanted to have many sons in glory. So even now, people who are listening to this program could say, at this moment I receive what Jesus Christ did for me that I might be accepted by Him and be with Him forever. I want you in a moment to talk and give an illustration about you went to the White House. But before you do that, people have heard us say that Jesus loves us. He loved us so much He went to the cross. We all know that we're sinners. None of us are perfect. None of us. Jesus says there's a broad way. There's a narrow way. The narrow way, unfortunately, has just a few people on it because other people take the Broadway, which looks good to them, and it's loaded with people. But if people want to make a switch from the Broadway and come over to the narrow way, which is by putting their faith in Jesus, I want them to realize that it's not Jesus plus something else that'll get them into heaven to be with Jesus. When Jesus died on that cross, did he do everything that was necessary for our sins to be forgiven? Or do I need to put faith in Jesus and do a few more things like going to church, praying, being good, taking the sacraments, taking communion, getting baptized? Do I need to do those things or I won't make it? Or did he do everything when he went to the cross? This, this is so critical. If we believe that when Jesus died on the cross, he did everything everything that ever will be necessary for us to stand in the presence of a holy God, totally redeemed. If we believe that, as the scriptures teach, we will not only be saved, but we will know it because we will understand that our salvation is not based on our very flawed performance. You said something very important. You're going to stand and give an account to a holy God, a God that knows all about you, not only what you did, but what you thought, what you had in your mind, what you had in your heart, your intent, your motivations, all of it. None of us are going to be perfect, but he knows that. But Jesus, when he made that sacrificial atonement on the cross for us, God put all of our sins, all of our thoughts, all of our lust, everything that's about us on Jesus, and he paid for all of it. And this holy, righteous God that's going to judge us someday is going to say, oh, 
my son died for you. You belong to him. Go on in. You know, John, I want to say this, that when we talk about God, we also have to talk about his wrath and his anger. That's correct. And the reason that people know Jesus Christ as Savior, the reason it's necessary for them and they should receive him is so that they will be with him forever. Yes, but also Jesus keeps us from the wrath to come. That's right. So it is very, very critical. And I know we don't have much time at all to talk about the return of Jesus, but we do know that he is going to return. And in the passage that you read in Acts chapter 1, just a few moments ago, it says, this Jesus who has ascended into heaven will in like manner return. Right. And he's going to return to the Mount of Olives, the Bible says in Zechariah chapter 14, his feet shall stand upon the Mount of Olives. And this is so exciting because the Bible says that when he returns in glory, we, who will have died by then, will have been resurrected by then, we will return with him triumphantly. You know, many of us want to visit Israel. Many of us have had the privilege of visiting Israel. But uh, there are many people who never will get there. And I always tell them, don't feel too badly, because if you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you will eventually get to Israel, and you'll be led there by a supreme tour guide, Jesus, who's going to establish his kingdom. So to all who are listening today, it is so critical that they understand the uniqueness of Jesus over against other options. That's correct. Now, you talked about the fact that one day you were invited to the White House. I'd like you to share that little story with our people. Many years ago, when security was not as big an issue as it is today, I was in Washington, D.C. with one of my daughters. A Secret Service agent was at a church where I was speaking, and he said, would you like to go to the White House tomorrow? He said, the president is out of town. This actually was the first George Bush who was president. So this was back in the 1980s. I said, sure. Well, we arrived there at the specific time, and we are invited to the White House. Of course, we connect with this agent. And uh, we come to those little huts that you see. And some of the agents that were there looked at me and looked at the agent we were with and said, if you're with him, that is with the Secret Service agent, you can go on in. Now, when we got to the White House itself, on the stairs, there were more guards. And they looked at me, and then they looked at who I was with. My daughter and I were with this uh, Secret Service agent, and they said, if you are with him, you can go on in. Now, when you go down the hallway and you get to the Oval Office, you find out that there's a guard right at the door. The guard was standing at attention, but looked at us and said, in effect, you can go on in. Now, we couldn't go to the president's desk, but we were able to actually go into the Oval Office. Why? Because of who we were with. Now, I want you to use your imagination for just a moment. When you die, or let us suppose that we were to all die collectively in some way, and let us suppose that we are on our way to the heavenly city. And let us also suppose that there have been some angels that are accompanying us, but also Jesus meets us at the point of our death. And so we are walking toward the heavenly city with Jesus. And I want you to imagine that there are angels along the way guarding the heavenly city. And they see us and they say, are you with him? Go on in. Finally, in the distance, we see the glory of God. And God is more holy than we ever visualized him to be. And then we have a flashback because we remember all of our sins. 
and we remember the regrets and the life that we have wasted and the evil that we have done. And we say to ourselves, I can't go in, I can't go any farther. But then the angels say, you're with him, you're with Jesus, go on in. And then if we can use our imaginations just a little farther, I can imagine that as we are there before the throne of Almighty God, the holy God of the universe who is localized there in heaven, and uh, he looks over the people, and uh, Jesus said, Father, these are the ones that I died for. These are the redeemed that belong to you and to me. And then the Father says, I have inspected them very carefully, and I find no fault in them. Why? Because they've been redeemed. Their debt has been paid, and as a result of that, they are welcomed into eternity forever. Let me ask you something. When you die, is Jesus going to be there for you? Is he going to say, come on in, be with me, or are you on your own? I urge you today to believe in the only one who is able to save you, the only one who is able to take us to the Father. He is there already, but all of us know that when we die, we are going into His presence, and because of Him, we have full acceptance. I want to repeat something I said earlier. The issue is not the greatness of your sin. I can imagine I'm talking to people who are criminals. The issue is not the greatness of your sin. God can receive you. The issue is the wonder of the redemption that Jesus purchased. We oftentimes sing that the vilest of sinners who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. That pardon is available to you. Would you pray with me? And I want you during this prayer to transfer your trust to Jesus. Ask Him to be your Savior, the one who forgives you, the one who will take you all the way to the Father's house. Lord, I pray for all those who have watched and those who have listened. I pray that you might work in their hearts and help them to understand that it is because of your grace and your mercy that we are saved. For those, Lord, who are struggling with all of their sins, we ask, Lord, that they will see Jesus as the one who paid for sinners. And if they trust him alone, they will be with you forever. I pray that right now people will be praying that prayer, Lord, I am a sinner and I need a savior and I receive Jesus Christ as my very own, not by works, but because of your grace and mercy. And I pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Erwin, and thank you folks for being with us today. And if you'll stay tuned, I'll have a final word for you in just a moment. Stay tuned for scenes from next week's program. Now, thanks for being with me today. If you've thought about what makes Jesus unique among the 4,300 religions in the world today, and you'd like to investigate the information for yourself that you've heard presented, as well as the facts given throughout this series about Jesus, I want you to know that we are making available all six TV programs with Dr. Erwin Lutzer on two DVDs for a gift of $39 each or both DVDs for $78. In program one, he explains why all attempts to unite Christ with other religions of the world are doomed to fail. In program two, how our prevailing culture of tolerance has altered even some of our Christian church's belief about God. Then in program three, why is it logically absurd to believe that all the religions of the world could be equally right? In program four, why does every religion have the responsibility of giving evidence for its truth claims 
that is accessible to believers and non-believers alike. In program five, we present the evidence for Jesus' extraordinary death and resurrection. In program six, the evidence that Jesus himself gave to show that he was the one and only qualified savior who was able to bring men and women to God. Now, in addition, we're making available Dr. Erwin Lutzer's excellent 252 page book, Christ Among Other Gods. And this is for a gift of $15. Now, this is a tremendous book, folks, that is full of crucial information that you'll all want to read. If you wish to have all six programs on two DVDs, plus Dr. Lutzer's important book, they are available together for a gift of only $90. Now, if you live in the US, you may order right now by calling us at 1-800-805-3030. That's 1-800-805-3030. And you may call that same number any day this week, 24 hours a day. Or you may give your gift at our website right now at jashow.org, where we have a secure place for you to give your gift. That's jashow.org. And then, if you live in Canada, would you please call us at 1-866-746-5847. That's one 866-746-5803. Or you may order at our Canadian website at jashow.ca. That's jashow.ca. And when we receive your gift, we will send you a receipt and a personal thank you. And I'll appreciate your help very much. Next week on The John Ankerberg Show, but one of the things I discovered was the universe has to be exactly the mass that it is for there to be any hope of life in the universe, which gave me the impression this God that created the universe seems to have a very high value and purpose for life and human beings in particular. Our goal is to present the evidence for the gospel worldwide and to encourage Christians in their walk with the Lord. This program is sponsored by the John Ankerberg Show Ministries and is made possible by the grace of God and your faithful prayers and gifts.